Bentley is synonymous with luxury and sophistication, but don't be mistaken. If you want a superb handling speed machine, they've got you covered too. In today's episode of Carfection on Roadshow, we're looking at the sumptuous flying spur, the aptly named Bentayga Speed, but first let's take a look at the all new Bentley Continental GT. Early morning up in Scotland and the new Bentley Continental GT. Doesn't get much better than that really. I wanted to come up here because, well, these are my favourite roads in the whole of the UK, possibly even the world, and I haven't been up here for ages. If you're going to bring it all this way, then there has to be a reason. Don't worry, I said, I'm sure I can find a connection between the new Conti and this beautiful country. At least, I hope I can. Now, obviously, I wanted to come up to Scotland for the wonderful driving roads up here, but the journey up here also gave me a chance to really experience the Conti in, well, I suppose the habitat that it was best at in its previous iteration, a long journey. And it was still very good. It's maybe lost just a little bit of the, I suppose, detachment, but you probably had to do that in order for it to be a better handling car. Whether it is or not, we'll get to in a moment. One thing that was certainly very impressive on the way up was that for a six litre W12, this averaged over 31 mpg, which is incredible, really. A lot of that's due to cylinder deactivation and the fact that it can, I think it's called sailing, basically, where it just decouples the clutch and you see the rev needle drop to idle. One of the things that really showed the old Continental GT's age was all the, well, infotainment, I suppose, the graphics and everything. And it's been, as you would expect, a massive leap on in this. There are certain elements that you can recognize from the Porsche Panamera. It's not just that chassis, but it's brilliant. It's everything you now expect of a Bentley. It's all up to date. This retina display is huge and really very, very beautiful. Now, what about those links between car and country? Of course, one of the really obvious deep rooted connections between Scotland and Bentley is that Scotland has lots of trees and the Bentley has some wood on its interior. Specifically, in this new Continental, you can spec an innovative dual veneer whereby you have a contrasting piano black split up with a chrome strip and then one of several beautiful veneers such as dark fiddleback or liquid amber. And in this particular Continental, there is a new veneer called Koa. This is a straight-grained mid-tone veneer native to Hawaii where they use it for surfboards and guitars. Of course in Scotland people also surf and play the guitar so really there was no other choice but to come here. This fascia is of course really this new Bentley's party piece the way it rotates here when you press this button so you get the things like the compass which I think is very fitting it means it is going to age much better than other cars I think whether that means it's going to last as long as the old Continental GT to wait and see all the switch gear obviously feels wonderful as well it's down here the sort of turned aluminium the diamond sort of quilting almost in the metal it's even on the back of things here you're never going to see it but you can feel it every time you open the door all very lovely and luxurious. In fact, it's so luxurious that despite prices starting at £157,000, you could probably somehow make a case for the Bentley being quite good value for money. Of course, this being a press car, it has all sorts of extra goodies on it, optional extras. And one of those is the upgraded stereo, and this is the top of the range one, so it's an extra £6,500. However, it's made by a company called Name, and although I'm confess to be an audiophile, it is the best one I have ever heard. And of course one of the reasons again for coming here is that the town of Nairn, if you just connect the R and the N, you get name. The big question though is when you reach a road like this, is it actually any fun? Because that was the trouble. You could do huge long distances in the old car, but although you could cover continents to get to a decent bit of road, once you were there, it was just frustrating because it didn't have the agility that you really wanted. So have they solved that 
with this new car? To a large extent, yes, they have. You've got much better turning in this car and you can now feel the outside rear wheel. You get a much better sense of exactly where it is. It points into a corner. The engine has been shifted further back and this is actually an engaging and enjoyable car down a good piece of road. This perhaps won't come as a great surprise once you realise that the new Continental GT shares a chassis with its cousin, the Porsche Panamera. It also has the powerful 48 volt anti-roll system that we first saw in the Mantega. Which is pretty necessary because while the Conti's curb weight has gone down by 76 kilos, you can still hear the Weybridge groan a little under its 2,244 kilo curb weight. Beneath the bonnet, by the way, is a 6 litre W12, putting out 626 brake horsepower and 664 pounds foot of torque from a ridiculously low 1350 RPM. For reference, that's 44 brake horsepower and 133 pounds foot more than the outgoing model. Hybridisation should be on the horizon for this generation of Conti 2, which might actually suit it rather well. You've got various settings. You've got B, where essentially the car makes its own mind up. Then you've got Sport, which locks everything down. Now in this, you obviously get the most amount of agility, but there is just a sense, perhaps. On a smooth track, I think it would be the one to go for. On the road, I think you're better off going for Custom, where you can have the weightier steering, the sporty engine, but you just knock the chassis back back to its just slightly more comfortable setting. The reason for doing that is that this car, well, it still weighs the best part of two and a quarter tonnes. And whilst you can disguise that sort of mass, eventually you are always going to butt up against it. Of course, the car, it sort of needs that, that heft, really, to be the, the cosseting constant cover that it, that it is. But dynamically, something like a DB11 will always feel lighter of foot because it's just not carrying as much weight around. So the reason for keeping this in its softer, damper setting is because the car, it just doesn't feel like it's trying to fight itself. You can still really enjoy that turn in, but you just, it feels more at ease. You find the car's natural, its natural gait, I suppose, through a corner. It's worth mentioning that while resolutely and pleasingly rear biased all the time, the torque split changes depending on the mode, with 38% going to the front axle in comfort mode and just 17% in the sport mode. It's not just the torque split and the weight distribution that make this a better driver's car, the steering weighting itself feels much better now. And the fact that it's switched to a PDK gearbox and dual clutch system also just helps you feel that much more connected to the drivetrain. The one thing that's perhaps a disappointment is that you just sit a little bit high. It's slightly odd. You, you get into it and it, it's not terrible, but you just find yourself instinctively trying to put the seat a bit lower. The seats are lovely though. Very good massage function. I'd pull up here because we're surrounded by valleys and the Scottish name for a valley is Glen. Glen is also a man's name and Glen Kidston was one of the Bentley boys. Tenuous enough for you? Glen Kidston is actually worth talking about because he was a fascinating character. In 1929, November 1929, he was involved in a plane crash. 20 minutes in a flight to Amsterdam, he realised the plane was in trouble, assumed a brace position and then survived the ensuing accident. Whilst on fire, he kicked out part of the fuselage, got out, doused himself in the damp grass to put the flames out, and then went back in again to help one of the other passengers who subsequently sadly died. He then fought his way through woodland in the middle of the night and flagged down motorists to get help whilst still smoking. He was then hospitalized with his burns. I mention this because only two months later, he lined up for the start of the Monte Carlo rally. He thought he'd have a crack in a new six and a half litre saloon. He started at John O'Groats, as they did in those days, and at two in the morning, he set off. They crashed, not far from here actually, near Dingwall, on the ice. They got a new front axle, arrived in Glasgow at 11 a.m. with no front brakes, and decided to push on for Monte Carlo anyway. He was an extraordinary person, and obviously connects this car to Scotland. Glens, extraordinary in all their forms. Absolutely love it up here. Somehow the scenery seems to fit the stature of this car and the big wide open roads 
this sort of car can just get into a flow, you can enjoy, you have time approaching each corner just to be able to manage the weight a little bit. It's still a car that just a bit of managing the weight distribution, perhaps just breaking a little bit on the way into corner just to get the weight onto the nose and then be able to drive through that more enjoyable torque distribution. One of the things about the old Continental GT is I said you should never underestimate its ability to sprint away from the line. Pull up next to one at the traffic lights, like the imaginary ones here, and total grip, no need to juggle clutches or balance it on the brakes, just takes off. So if you ever pull up next to a Continental GT, no matter what you're in, be it a McLaren or an Aerial Atom, be very, very wary before you try and race it away from the lights. That 0-60 time, by the way, is a mere 3.6 seconds, and the new Conti will go on to 207 miles an hour flat out. But it is the new Continental GT's behaviour in the corners that is the real Nikon. Gone is the sensation, particularly in the old W12, of a heavy nose ploughing on. Now, thanks to that big engine being set 150mm further back in the chassis, you have a much more balanced and enjoyable car. The old car was very one-dimensional, and whilst this isn't it's not hugely expressive, but it just lets you play with the balance so much more than the old car. An Aston Martin DB11 is more agile, a 911 Turbo is quicker, and a suite at the Savoy is more luxurious. But the Bentley Continental GT combines speed, sumptuousness and dynamism in a package that manages very cleverly not to feel like merely a jack of all trades. This new version has addressed the shortcomings of the old car with unerring accuracy, while maintaining the qualities that endeared it to so many. And now, at the end of the day, to cement the clear and in no way spurious links between the Continental GT and Scotland, I've brought us here to a whisky distillery. Why? Well, because the wonderful headlights of Continental GT took clear inspiration from a whisky tumbler, such as this one that I just happened to have brought with me. And as it's the end of our journey, I can actually have a drink. Cheers. How are you getting home? Trossacks. Henry will be back later to drive the epic Bentayga speed, but first we're heading to the streets of Monte Carlo and something a little more old school. Monte Carlo, home of the rich and famous. People with wealth can be the first to adopt new trends, but they can also hold on to some traditional notions the rest of the world has moved on from. Mechanical watches, fountain pens, riding horses, all used to be the only way of doing certain things, but now are reserved for connoisseurs, collectors, and those who can afford the higher prices they now all fetch. And where regular people buying cars are starting to really turn their backs on the humble saloon car in favour of SUVs and crossovers, when you go further up the luxury chain to the more expensive manufacturers, well, they're still making them. Cars, in fact, like this, the new Bentley Flying Spur, which is waving the flag for the traditional three-box, four-door shape. The modern incarnation of the Flying Spur came to us not that long after the Continental GT came back. So about 14 years ago, but for the first two generations, the Flying Spur always felt like, well, basically just a stretched Continental GT. But now for this, Bentley tells us in the third generation, oh, they've completely overhauled it, pulled all the best parts of all the other cars and put it into something truly special. And while the Continental GT may be seen as the quintessential Bentley of the modern era, and the Bentayga is by far the best-selling Bentley, the Flying Spur offers drivers something different. Something perhaps less fashionable, but nonetheless exquisite. Now, you could be forgiven for having kind of forgotten about the Flying Spur. It's not as big as the full-on limousine Mulsan, but it's longer and has more room in the back seats than the GT does. It does feel like they've gone to a lot of effort to make this car visually stand out from the pack. There is a much greater difference now between the Flying Spur and the GT than there ever has been. This feels a lot more well proportioned, the stance is better, the power line down the side is crisp and sharp, those Bentley haunches are there and they give it some real presence. 
It's also the least shouty of all the Bentleys, the most subdued in presence, the least flashy. It's a handsome ride, but far more likely to quietly slide through traffic without drawing too much attention to itself. And with the newly restyled Flying Bee being able to be retracted into the bonnet, you can turn this into a legitimate cue car. At the heart of it all is a very familiar beast indeed. Up front, there's Bentley's very own 6-litre W12 engine, the same as in the Continental GT. Although Bentley do make a great V8, the way the W12 delivers power is still, to me, the only way to have your Bentley. 0 to 60 comes in just 3.7 seconds, and if you find a road long enough, it will get all the way up to 207 miles an hour. The gearbox is the same ZF 8-speed dual-clutch unit that the Continental GT has, which has been lifted from Porsche. Think of it as a transplanted PDK, and while I enjoyed the previous torque converter ZF gearbox in the previous generation, if you're going to find a new dual-clutch gearbox, then the Porsche PDK seems the best place to go. It's not just the gearbox though, the chassis has also been developed from that on the Panamera, making those cars brothers from other mothers, and frankly, I'm okay with that. There's now 626 brake horsepower on offer, and a whopping 644 pounds-feet of torque. That huge amount of torque that the car now has can almost feel like too much torque. It's great when you're going for an overtake and you just want to go from 60 to 80 miles an hour. That's fine, but off the line, my word, this thing packs a punch. Considering how heavy this car is, it's really quite impressive. The new three-chamber air suspension allows the car to have a much greater variety in driving modes in terms of comfort or performance, and you can kind of dial it in with the Bentley control dial into how you want it. But keep it in Bentley mode, their kind of recommended automatic mode, and you do get a nice balance between it absorbing the bumps and keeping you from rolling. Obviously, it's got the same 48 volt anti-roll system that we first saw in Bentayga and is now on the new Continental GT as well. Now, in normal driving conditions, it's soft and serene and comfortable. MVH is limited to an absolute bare minimum and it's a very serene place to be. But if you need to go for an overtake or anything like that, plant your foot and that wave of torque just it gets quite scary quite quickly. There is no disguising the Flying Spur's weight though, and especially once you get it up to speed, you do notice that there is some heft to put about. The brakes are good enough that they can stop you dead. It's the biggest steel brakes fitted to any car in the world. Although the power is only up a small amount in this car, the huge amount of extra torque, the new suspension system, the gearbox, it all ties together to make this a huge leap forward for the Flying Spur. As a driver's car, it feels very similar to the new Continental GT, which is high praise indeed. The new cylinder deactivation technology makes it more economical on long journeys to add to the serene comfort and ease of driving. When you get to a more challenging stretch of road, you're rewarded with a much more engaging drive. It's perhaps slightly less direct on the steering than the Continental GT, but the similarities on handling are noticeable. The extra length of the flying spur over the Conti is actually offset by rear wheel steer, which really does make you forget how long the car actually is and massively improves handling. Obviously, the Bentley driving experience is maintained in this as you would expect. So everything you touch, everything you see, everything you smell is amazing. This is genuine Bentley leather. They may go for vegan options in future, but for now, whenever you buy a Bentley, it's clad with seven or more bulls worth of leather. And as an optional extra in this car, we've got 3D leather, which at a glance looks like it's quilted and padded, but is actually this firm stuff in the door. The metal surfaces have got these tactile knurled feels to it. Every stock, every dial, everything feels great to the touch. The Flying Spur provides three separate kind of experiences. There's driving it as an owner, driving the car as a chauffeur, where you've got passengers who you want to ferry around in comfort. And then there's the experience of being a passenger and you want to be able to enjoy all the luxuries that the car has to offer. And the Flying Spur manages to tick all of those boxes. The single biggest difference between the Flying Spur and the Continental GT is this right here, the back seat, whereas the 
the GT is technically a two plus two. The Flying Spur, plenty of room, and not just room, comfort in abundancy. These headrests are some of the most comfortable things you could ever hope to lay your head on, and just you instantly want to nap. The uh, control systems that you have, this new ejectable uh, remote control here, if I press the eject button, it should come gently out to me. There, nice and nifty. Feels a little bit like a very high-end mobile phone. It allows me to control the media, the seats. I can slide the passenger seats in front of me forward to give myself even more leg room. I can control the blinds. It's just an extra way of being able to control the car. One of the coolest things is this gives me control over the flying bee in the front of the car. I can either raise or lower it, and the animation will show me it happening right there, which is good because from here, I can't actually see the flying bee. Now, in the hands of a skilled chauffeur, this seat back here can be one of the most comfortable places to be in the world. If you have a spirited driver in the driver's seat, however, because you're so far back in the car, it can feel like you're being thrown around a little bit. So that improved handling on challenging roads you get as the driver can potentially come at a cost to your rear seat passengers. My advice, drive it yourself or hire a great chauffeur. And that's it, the Flying Spirit does have supercar-like credentials in terms of its acceleration and its top speed. It seems a bit of a cliche, but we were doing some thinking. It's actually faster to 60 than a Lamborghini Murcielago. It's got a higher top speed than a Ferrari 599, and it's better looking than me. So it drives pretty much like a Continental GT and it has similar practicality to a Bentayga. So why go for the Flying Spur? While the world is turning its back on saloons, why should someone still fight the tides of fashion? A saloon car has, well, it's got that executive vibe about it. Someone who knows their worth, who knows how important they are, but doesn't need to shout about it quite so loud. So why would you pick this over something like a Bentayga? Which I think is a far more valid comparison than comparing it to another saloon car because really Bentley customers are going to be making that choice. Bentayga is super popular. You're gonna see loads of them out on the road. Maybe that's reason enough to go with a saloon car. Be different, be old fashioned, stand out. It's like dressing like a dandy. It's something that used to get done an awful lot but now allows you to be a little bit different from the rest. In terms of practicality, Yes, the Bentayga might have a slightly more boot space. If you fold the seats down, if you have that option, you can get a little bit more in. And yes, it has more ground clearance. I will not accept the ability for it to go off-road as a feature that you'd make your mind up on, because frankly, who has ever seen a Bentayga off-road? The Flying Spur shows us that not only are saloon cars not dead, they can still be some of the best driver's cars in the world. Let the masses indulge themselves in oceans of SUVs. For those who really know the value of a great car, rides like the Flying Spur will be waiting in the wings. Saloon cars may be out of style right now, but something that most definitely still is in fashion are SUVs, and Bentley make a particularly quick one. Welcome to the new Bentley Bentayga Speed, which is, well, speedier. This new ultimate version of the Bentayga now does 190 miles an hour, making it the fastest SUV currently on sale. In fact, the fastest production SUV ever, taking the title away from a Lamborghini Urus by half a mile an hour. Now, the trouble is, it's only three miles an hour faster than a normal Bentayga, and in fact, it's only 26 brake horsepower more powerful than a normal Bentayga. You don't get any more torque either, the speed having to make do with the standard car's admittedly ample 664 pounds foot. And at 3.9 seconds, the 0 to 62 mile an hour time is only a couple of tenths quicker than the standard car. So, three miles per hour and a couple of tenths. Doesn't feel like a lot for 20,000 pounds. However, 
There are a couple of other reasons why this speed version is interesting. For a start, this is probably the one that everyone will buy, as Bentley customers seem to have a penchant for top-of-the-range models. Then there is the fact that this has a new exhaust, which sounds so bombastically fantastic that it almost justifies the extra money on its own. It's by Akrapovich, yes that is how you pronounce it, and adds a load more character from this W12 engine. You also get a, a rear roof spoiler, I should have mentioned that. Crucial, I think you'll agree, to making this look a much more pleasant vehicle. There have also been changes to the chassis settings with 15% firmer suspension and attendant tweaks to the 48 volt anti-roll system. All the dynamic changes actually only happen when you put the car into sport mode, which is when you get the louder exhaust as well. In the corners, it's impressive, but you never have a clue really through the steering what's going on. And I can't say it's something that's particularly enjoyable. It can handle the mass of that 48 volt roll system, but never disguise it. It is marvellously comfortable on the motorway, and it doesn't look too imperious in this shade of grey. However, the interior, while it gets Alcantara for the first time, feels a bit dated next to the Continental GT and Flying Spur. And I don't think this red colour scheme helps matters. Bentley calls it cricket ball. So is there any joy to be had from a Bentayga speed? Well, yes, in one respect really that of feeling a huge amount of mass travelling very, very quickly. And the Bentayga speed can travel very, very quickly. There is a certain majesty to a lot of mass moving fast. Just look back at videos of Jonah Lomu sprinting down a rugby pitch. And to demonstrate this with the Bentayga speed, we've come to Bruntingthorpe Aerodrome in Leicestershire. Opened in 1942, it was initially used by the RAF during the Second World War. Control was then passed to the US Air Force, which used it as a base for B-47 Stratojet nuclear bombers in the Cold War. This is when the runway was widened and almost doubled in length to a monstrous 3,000 metres, or 1.8 miles. After the US Air Force left in the mid-60s, the site was sold off. It was bought in the 70s by Chrysler before being sold to the current owners, the Walton family, about 10 years later. I've been coming here for years and you see all sorts of car tests taking place here, but the actual location is not pretty, but it's an amazing place to spend time. Apart from else, there are some extraordinary aircraft here. The Cold War Jets collection has its home at Bruntingthorpe, and there is everything from a mighty Nimrod to a Buccaneer to a Canberra to a VC-10. There are also a couple of old 747s, one of which has been used for an explosion test. It is a fascinating place. Of all the planes here, probably my favourite is actually the Hawker Hunter. It's just such a pretty looking plane. But probably the most famous is this, the Handley Page Victor. It's part of the trio of planes that made up the V bombers, the Avro Vulcan and the Vickers Valent being the other two. This particular one, Tizintina or Meldrew, is XM715 and it lives here at Bruntingthorpe and does fast taxiing, which actually is part of the reason it's famous because it was the last Victor ever to fly, slightly accidentally when it took off here during one of those fast taxi days. Anyway, this is one of the planes that was converted to a tanker and more famously, better known perhaps for taking part in this, Operation Black Buck, which was the famous long-range bombing of the Falklands, Port Stanley Airport. The bombing itself was carried out by the Vulcans, but these did the refuelling on the way, and it was just extraordinary. I recommend Roland White's book Vulcan 607 if you haven't read about it. And if you think that the Victor doesn't look that extraordinary by modern standards, just consider this. One of these first flew in 1952, or just seven years after the end of the Second World War, when propeller-powered planes like Lancaster's and Wellington's were the norm. It represents a simply staggering rate of progress. And talking of staggering rates of progress... 
The way this gets off the line, it's not even dry today. It's just amazing. That's 110 miles an hour already. It travels like a brick hull in a riot. 140. That's 150, seemingly like that. Just amazing. That's 160 and I'm gonna break. We haven't got, we no longer have the full length of this extraordinary Cold War runway, but there's enough of it. The other thing that's worth mentioning is that for a car that weighs two and a half tons, you need a pretty impressive set of brakes. And thankfully this has some very big ones. The biggest, in fact, sounds a bit like something Donald Trump might say, but these are 440 millimetres in diameter, which is 17 inches, which when you start comparing that, it's a 17 inch set of wheels, is not a small set of wheels in my mind somehow, and that's the size of the brakes. Madness. Of course, we weren't going to do that just once. impressive being in something this big and being this high up. In fact, with all that mass moving so fast, it's almost possible to imagine that you are in some sort of large aircraft, which is not entirely inappropriate given that W.O. Bentley did design two rotary aircraft engines during the First World War. And of course there is the famous Flying Bee badge on the bonnet. Perhaps if you just pulled back on the steering wheel. And take off. Thanks for watching. This film was produced by our sister channel, Carfection. There's a link to their channel on screen right now. And if you'd like to see more of these long features, subscribe to us right here on Roadshow and hit the bell icon to never miss an episode.